We are proudly the oldest lake association in the state of Maine, founded in 1908. And our charge is to protect and improve the watershed of Great Pond and Long Pond through preservation, education, and action. Our presentation tonight is a cooperative effort of many organizations and municipalities, as you can see listed on the screen. The public meeting is the first of many to inform you of the work being done and needing to be done to preserve our lakes. In 2018, BLA conducted a watershed survey of Great Pond with the assistance of our project partners and many, many volunteers. We found 237 sites that had active erosion at differing levels of impact to our lake. And we are working to provide assistance to those sites through our many programs. The BLA and the Seven Lakes Alliance have co-funded an erosion control coordinator to work with landowners at their request. That's how vital we think this is. As a note, there was a long pond survey done this past fall and that will be discussed at a separate meeting. We will be focused not only on Great Pond, but the impact of the entire Great Pond watershed. And keep in mind that whatever happens in Great Pond flows over the dam and through Long Pond, linking these two vital watersheds together. So let's start with a few housekeeping items. You are all on mute. If you have information or a comment, please use the chat button that's located on the bottom of your screen. Any questions that you have will be for our panel will be should be entered in the Q&A section and those will be just uh, answered at the end of the meeting. So you will find the Q&A button right down near the chat button on the bottom of your screen. As we move through the presentations, there are five polling questions. We ask you to go ahead and click on those. All the answers are anonymous, so we won't know who said what. And that will help us in providing feedback when we do our management plan wrap up. Our panelists tonight will introduce themselves as we move through the presentation. But as you look at the names on the screen, you can see that it is truly a collaborative project. Our goal tonight is to report on the latest water quality findings, present management and action plans, and obtain your feedback, which is most helpful to us. You may wonder what this is all about. It's about reversing the declining water quality trends that are indicated by our various monitoring efforts. And to do that, we must find ways to keep the dirt out of the lake. So if you take one thing away from tonight's presentation, remember that, keep the dirt out of the lake. And now I'd like to introduce Anthony Wilson. He is the town manager for the town of Belgrade. So when I became the town manager about a year and a half ago, one of the first questions that I encountered was, what do you know about lakes? And honestly, I do not know a lot about the science of lakes, although I am learning. But I do know this with certainty, and that is that the lakes and the water within our lakes are really the lifeblood of our communities. And I'm talking about Rome and Belgrade in particular. And that's true from a recreational standpoint. It's certainly true from an aesthetic standpoint. And it is true from an economic standpoint. What a lot of folks don't realize is that 60% of Belgrade's tax base are lakefront properties. In Rome, the percentage is even higher, it's 80%. And so it's a very important process and effort for us to preserve and protect our lakes. And that's one of the reasons why the town of Belgrade recently initiated a lakes committee is to ensure the preservation and protection of those lakes. So as Carol mentioned, we're gonna have a couple of questions throughout this uh, process. And here's question number one, and we'd like your feedback on this so we know whom we're talking to. And the question is simply this, what is your connection to Great Pond? And here's the, the responses. I'll read through these real quickly. My family or I own a year round property on the lake. My family and I own a seasonal property on the lake. 
I do not own any property on the lake, but use the lake often for recreation. That would be the choice that the Wilsons would choose. State or town official, I guess I would be that as well, uh, or other. So if you would just click on one of those buttons because we're really interested in just learning more about our audience tonight and your perspectives. And everyone has just a few seconds uh, to decide on this. And uh, once everyone has had a chance to vote, uh, then we are going to be able to see the responses here in real time. So uh, as I mentioned, when uh, I first visited Belgrade uh, about a year and a half ago, I was really struck by the beauty and the, just the majesty of our lakes. And so here's our responses. And you can see that 49% of our uh, attendees tonight Either they or their family owned a seasonal property, a camp, uh, on one of our lakes. Uh, and so uh, the Wilsons would fall in one of those small categories, the 5% who don't own any property on the lake, but use the lake often uh, for recreation. So uh, we also have a, a second question that we would like for you to answer at this time. And that question is, how long have you been living on or visiting Bray Pond? And so we have a range of choices here, less than a year, one to five years. That would be me at this point. Although I hope to be in one of these other categories in the coming years, five to 10 years, over 10 years. I don't live on Great Pond, but live in the region or none of the above, not applicable. So uh, one of the, the things that has struck me as I've met people in our community is the long history that a lot of people have uh, with our lakes. It's inevitable when I'm talking to people that they tell me that their family has owned a camp on Great Pond or Long Pond or Salmon Lake since the 40s or the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. And honestly, uh, I'm a little resentful that my parents or grandparents didn't buy a, a main camp at some point uh, many, many decades ago. So again, if you'll uh, click on one of these, we'll have the, uh, the answers here shortly. And here they are. And you can see the vast majority of our uh, attendees tonight, more than three-fourths, have uh, been living on or regularly visiting uh, Great Pond for more than 10 years. That does not surprise me uh, in the least. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Charlie Bader. Charlie is the Director of Conservation Programs for the Seven Lakes Alliance. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I'm with uh, Seven Lakes Alliance. I work in land conservation and in water quality programs. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm gonna just start off talking about the Great Pond watershed. Um, the concept of the watershed is that all the water that you see uh, in that outlined area flows into Great Pond. And in addition, um, and that, that particular area is about 32 square miles. In addition, as you know, um, East Pond and North Pond and Salmon Lake and McGraw Pond also flow into uh, Great Pond through two large tributaries. Uh, Great Pond is an 8,500 acre lake, has five major tributaries, including uh, the two I just mentioned. Uh, it touches five towns. There's a little bit in Oakland, uh, but the majority of the uh, lake is in uh, Rome and in Belgrade, and part of the watershed is in Mercer, as you can see right here. Uh, we sent letters to about 1,600 landowners uh, living in the Great Pond watershed when we did the survey, and that's the uh, reference to the landowners there. Water quality is a reflection of the watershed. The, the quality of the water depends on us and what we do on the ground, and that is what is meant by that statement. Um, whether that's uh, work that we do in uh, development or forestry or agriculture, um, all of that impacts lake water quality. Uh, we're going to ask another question. Um, what is your overall impression of water quality in Great Pond? And I'll read the, uh, the choices. Uh, from excellent to good to average to below average to poor. And 
And the choices uh, came in with seven uh, saying it's excellent, 55% saying it's good, about 25% saying it's average, and about 10% uh, below average, with 2% saying it's poor. Thank you for uh, giving us your feedback. I want to talk about the context of where we are. Um, when this uh, says that by most standards, what we're looking at is national standards. Uh, by national standards, uh, the water quality is good to excellent. Um, Maine lakes continue to have what's regarded as clean water, good clarity, good fishing and boating. Uh, for example, um, Massachusetts has 30% of its lakes uh, with invasive plants, Maine less than uh, 2%. So by national standards, we're doing well, um, but we're concerned with the direction, and that's the next slide. We have problems. As you all know, we've had invasive milfoil in Great Pond for at least 10 years and have been working on it hard for the last eight years. Um, last year, 2020, this year, sorry, <laughs> uh, we removed 33,000 gallons of milfoil, and that is a, a pile of milfoil uh, with the uh, person standing next to it, one of our workers um, at the Wall Farm being composted uh, in Belgrade. Uh, we also laid down 65,000 square feet, about an acre and a half of burlap barrier, and that barrier is put on the bottom of the lake and it prevents plants from regrowing after we pick them. Good news is we had no new infestations in Great Pond in 2020. Um, we continue to survey Great Pond and Long Pond carefully, uh, and uh, we also have an army of um, folks that are also helping us uh, keep their eyes on the lake to make sure that we don't have uh, milfoil uh, spreading in the lake. And uh, we documented no new infestations this year. Um, the full progress report for the year uh, is available at the BLA and Seven Lakes websites. Other problems in Great Pond include Gliotrichia and Metaphytin. Uh, the two uh, pictures on the right, those are two types of algae. Uh, the Metaphytin is the pillow algae that is at the bottom, typically. Uh, the um, Gliotrichia is the what's called the tapioca um, uh, algae, and it floats in the water. Uh, and the algal bloom that you see at the bottom on the left is actually from North Pond. We have not had an algal bloom like that on Gray Pond, and we want to keep it that way. Um, I want to emphasize that algae um, is fed um, by a number of things, but one of the nutrients that feeds it is phosphorus. Too much phosphorus results in the problem that you see in the bottom left, which is an algal bloom. Um, the other plants that uh, you saw, the other algae also feed on, on phosphorus. Um, right now, we are at a level that is uh, below, um, thankfully, uh, the level that would initiate algal blooms, but we want to keep it that way. Uh, again, phosphorus, uh, I mentioned, is a nutrient. It's naturally occurring. It's, it's plant food. Uh, it's what you put in your fertilizer, along with nitrogen and uh, potassium. Um, and uh, it comes from all sorts, of, all sorts of different sources. It comes from the atmosphere. As I said, it comes from fertilizer. It comes from your septic systems. It comes from pet waste. A big factor is soil erosion and the runoff that carries soil erosion to the lake. And that's something we can do something about. It's tough to do something about the atmosphere. Fertilizer and septic and pet, we can also do something about. I mentioned uh, runoff. Um, the way that phosphorus gets to the lake is through runoff. Um, whether that runoff connects to a ditch and then to a stream to the lake, you can see in this picture. Um, it runs across your yard, it runs uh, through the woods, it runs through development um, and uh, through agricultural fields. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a lot of uh, very active agriculture in this watershed, we have some. Uh, and most of what is uh, being done is being done carefully uh, from what we know. Um, so agriculture is a factor in our phosphorus issue, 
Uh, but most of the problem is coming from development, residential development, commercial development, and roads. Again, too much uh, phosphorus equals, um, again, algae. And uh, when it gets too high, algal blooms. Again, that's coming from the uh, external loading or from the dirt and runoff. It's also coming from inside the lake. As you can see, there's something called internal loading. Um, and that is when the oxygen in the lake gets too low and that stimulates uh, algae uh, release um, as well. We want to ask another question. We have five in total. And uh, the fourth is, have you felt concerned about any of the following? And I'll read the list. During your time on the pond, have you felt concerned about any of the following? And please choose as many as um, concern you. Uh, the first is algal blooms. Uh, also, a green tinge in the water. Second is excessive plant growth. Third is water levels. Fourth is shoreline erosion. And fifth is invasive plants. Well, there's a lot of concerns. Um, algal blooms, 76% of folks are concerned about that. 50% are concerned about plant growth. 50% are concerned about water levels. 64% about shoreline erosion. And the number one is 86% with invasive plants. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle Wayne. Danielle Wayne is the science director at Seven Lakes, and she's going to be talking about our water quality uh, science. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, as Charlie said, I'm the lake science director at Seven Lakes Alliance, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our the water quality monitoring that's gone on on Great Pond and what the trends in water quality have told us. So water quality has been measured on Great Pond for 50 years. So the Maine Department of Environmental Protection has data going back to 1970 um, for water quality in the lake. Uh, so it's been measured for a while. In 2010, Great Pond is listed as impaired by the Maine DEP due to trends in declining water clarity. So the water clarity was getting worse. That's all this data we've been collecting lets us look at these long-term trends. Um, as a result of that, we started increasing the amount of monitoring we did in Great Pond. In 2015, Colby began a lot of intensive monitoring and put in Goldie, that yellow buoy you see, uh, which measures water quality parameters continuously all through the summer. Um, and then later, the Colby Seven Lakes Alliance Water Quality Initiative was formed. And so we do a lot of measurements through that, which allows us to cover the whole year. Uh, we're out there in the winter doing measurements as well. Uh, and we work with the students at Colby as, re as regular interns on doing that work during the summer. Then in 2018, there was the watershed survey, which Carol mentioned at the beginning of the program. Um, and that was uh, to identify sites in the watershed, which might be contributing to erosion within the watershed. And then now here we are at, in 2020 about to finish this watershed based management plan. And that's one of the purposes of this. We've taken all this data from the water quality monitoring and the watershed survey, and we're here to develop a plan. Um, and that's what we're doing. That'll be done in January, 2021. So, How do we measure water quality? Well, one of our most basic water quality measurements is something called a Secchi disk. And it's just a black and white disk like you see here in this picture. And all we do is we lower it down slowly until we can't see it anymore. And that tells us how clear the water is. 
And the Seki disc, while really simple, is amazing in the sense that we've been doing these measurements for 50 years. So we have a record of how the water clarity in Great Pond has changed over a very long time. Seki measurements have been done around the world for over 100 years. They're done in lakes and oceans. It's a very common measurement. It tells us a lot of information and it's very simple. Um, so, as I mentioned, there was a declining trend in water clarity in Great Pond, which led to it being listed as impaired in 2010. And so here, I just showed you data from the last 10 years. What have we learned from this data? So on the bottom, we have time going from 2011 to 2020. And then on the y-axis, we basically have the water clarity, how deep we can see. And so the little secchi disks tell us those data points. Uh, as we can see, in the last 10 years, the water has become less clear. Um, and we're in an upward trajectory. And what we're trying to do is staying out of that red zone. And that's the purpose of this whole, it, this whole process, is to keep us keep our water quality good. So what else do we measure? So one of the key things we measure is phosphorus. As Charlie pointed out about how important phosphorus is in terms of promoting algal blooms, and we need to understand where phosphorus is coming from in the water and in the sediments. So we're out there collecting samples of these things, which we run in conjunction with Colby. Um, this is gonna tell us where, in, where the phosphorus in the lake is coming from. And Jen's gonna talk a little bit more about how we incorporate that data into our management plan. But Overall, how is our water quality? Well, uh, you know, we got, it was interesting to hear what people's experiences of what they think the water quality is like in Great Pond. Uh, objectively, based on the main standards, we're basically right in the middle between lakes with a little algae and lakes with a lot of algae. Uh, to put that in context though, whoops, 35 years ago, Great Pond was much closer to the lakes with a little algae. So one of the purposes, again, is to stop the movement of the dial towards the red zone here. Now, an example of what happens when you hit the red zone, we have the, the example of North Pond from the summer. So on the right, we can see three pictures. The top picture is really powerful because that is North Pond and Little North Pond. And North Pond had about twice as much phosphorus as Little North Pond over the summer, just because of the nature of their watersheds. And you can see one lake is green and the other is not. And so what happens is you pass into this red zone and that's when you start to get lake-wide algal blooms. So the middle photo is, is a bog stream entering Great Pond. And then at the bottom, that's a picture taken by a drone down at Pine Tree Camp. So see a lot of green pictures of the lake this summer. We're trying to avoid Great Pond going into this red zone. So we want to ensure this never hits the red zone. And the way we do that is we need to reduce the phosphorus inputs into the lake. And basically we want to reverse the trend. And that's one of the other things you're going to hear a lot tonight. We're going to keep the dirt out of the lake so we can reverse the trend. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jen, who's going to talk about the sources of phosphorus within the lake. Thank you, Danielle. My name is Jen Jesperson. I'm with Ecological Instincts, and I'm an environmental consultant. Was hired to assist with the modeling effort and to write the watershed management plan. So this is a two-year project that uh, all of us have been working on, and we're getting close to the end, which is really exciting. And um, so, as part of the watershed management plan, we needed to look at the sources of phosphorus because we know that phosphorus is really important. Um, in this puzzle of figuring out um, how to address um, water quality problems. So in terms of phosphorus, we look at the big picture is that there's six sources of phosphorus that we're concerned about. So phosphorus can be deposited from the air and that is atmospheric deposition. Uh, we can also get phosphorus in the water from wildlife, specifically waterfowl. We may also have some discharges, direct discharges. In the Great Pond watershed, that's not something we're concerned about. That's more of like a point source um, that we would know about. Um, we don't have that. Um, there's also groundwater influence. So phosphorus coming in through the groundwater as base flow. And then internal recycling, which is phosphorus that's been built up in the sediment from runoff over many, many years. That phosphorus is stored at the bottom of the lake and that can also be released up into the water column. And then watershed runoff um, over on the left is the final source that we're looking at. So uh, as part of the watershed modeling effort, we did a land cover update 
And this was really to get a snapshot of the current conditions in the watershed. So what, what type of different land uses are there in the watershed? Knowing that different types of land use um, have different levels of phosphorus coming off them. So for example, there's a lot of green on this map. The green area is representing the forested areas in the watershed and the light green um, are forested watersheds. So you can see that there's a lot of undeveloped um, forest uh, land in the watershed. And um, so I'm gonna go forward a slide here, sorry. What we learned from this um, exercise is that there is a lot of undeveloped land left in the watershed, which is great um, because the more development you have, the more impacts you have to water quality because um, stormwater flows over developed property but it gets taken up, phosphorus gets taken up in these undeveloped areas. So for example, we know that 70% of the land in the watershed is forested and 16% of that is, is wetland. So 86% of the watershed is still considered undeveloped. Um, and 10% of that area is um, developed. So in the, in the map, you'll probably see this developed land as these red areas um, primarily the shoreline development and also um, other types of residential or commercial development along the roads, which are also considered development um, that kind of circle around the lake or um, go up into the upper watershed. Some other colors that might stand out to you are these pink areas. These pink areas represent logging, recent logging um, in the watershed. So the forests aren't pristine by any means. There's definitely impacts that are happening um, within those forested areas. Uh, agriculture shows up as these little yellow pockets and then some developed open space may, um, is in the orange. So I think this is the golf course here. Um, any kind of other parks or large um, lawn areas fall into that uh, developed open space. What's really important to take home from this um, modeling exercise with the land cover is that the, the, the undeveloped land, while it has a large percentage of the area, has a much smaller percentage of the phosphorus um, load that's getting to Great Pond. So 70% of forest area, but only 43% of the phosphorus load compared to 10% developed area and 39% of the phosphorus load. So, um, that was looking at the direct watershed. Um, as part of the modeling, we also want to look at what are the upstream influences to Great Pond, because we know that East Pond flows into North Pond and North Pond flows into Great Pond and McGraw and Salmon Pond flow into Great Pond. So we want to understand um, what the contributions of those upstream water bodies are. And so we can actually use the real data that's being collected by um, by Seven Lakes Alliance and Colby College and these upstream lakes to um, kind of calibrate our model and to uh, understand what these sources might be. And you can see that there's all these different basins. So we can take the, the larger watershed and we broke that into nine sub basins and then further broke that down to about 50 or so um, drainage areas. And these little teeny blue lines that you see all over place, these are all little tiny streams and drainages that flow into the lake. So you can imagine anywhere that you're in the watershed, you're probably close to one of these drainages, which is why it's really important for us to um, keep our eye out for erosion because there's a, if it's not just these main tributaries, it's all these other little tiny tributaries that feed into these larger tributaries. Um, another thing that we can do by breaking this watershed out into all these drainages is that the model can tell us where the greatest source of phosphorus is within all these tiny little sub basins. And then we can focus management efforts on um, areas that have the highest phosphorus loading. So I showed you this six sources of phosphorus a little bit earlier. And what I wanted to do is present to you what the model estimates for where the phosphorus is coming from. So I'm gonna start with the things that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, and that is atmospheric deposition, which is about 12% of the phosphorus load and then waterfowl, which is 3%. When we, and I mentioned again, we don't have any direct discharges. Okay, so that's 15% um, of the load. We can't really do too much about. So that leaves us with internal recycling, groundwater and watershed runoff. 
So internal recycling is estimated to be about 10% of the phosphorus load. And this is a little bit lower than we uh, had estimated in, in the past, um, which is a good thing. Um, and it's because there was some intensive monitoring that was done over the last three to five years to better understand the uh, influence of internal recycling on Great Pond. Groundwater, um, in this case, I'm specifically talking about septic systems. The model estimates about 3% from septic systems. And what I wanna say is um, the data that we had available about the state of the septic systems in the watershed was not um, all that good. So we drew on what we could, but um, there, we really need to know more about it before we can come up with a really good estimate as this number could be five to 7% higher. Um, than what we're estimating if we had better data. Um, and so just to think about um, if you have an older septic system, if there's an, uh, a leaky or a failing septic system somewhere on the shoreline, that system is gonna have some significant localized impacts to the water quality there uh, by putting nutrients directly into the water. So you may actually be seeing like metaphyton or, um, or some other kind of, um, impact or you may not and that phosphorus could be contributing to the big pool. Watershed runoff then is the largest um, contributor of phosphorus in, in, uh, in Great Pond at 72%. So this is really important. This includes both the direct and, and upstream lake watersheds contributing to the, the phosphorus pool. So, so the, um, this graph is really one thing that we can do with modeling that's really cool is uh, we can take away all the development and just pretend what did everything look like before there was development in this watershed. And we do that by clearing out all the development and putting everything back into forest land. And what we were able to determine was that we could estimate that the concentration of phosphorus in Great Pond before anybody uh, arrived and started putting in roads or houses was around 3.8 parts per billion. So a very low level of phosphorus uh, in Great Pond. Today, that number is um, the average phosphorus concentration in Great Pond is nine parts per billion, which means that that concentration has more than doubled um, since pre-development to current conditions. So um, we also have um, some information that 20 years from now we could estimate um, what it might look like based on the um, build out analysis that was done for the long pond management plan showed that with um, no phosphorus standards in place in 20 years from now, um, we could see numbers above 10 parts per billion. So the message is let's hold the line. Um, let's work on reversing this trend of upward um, concentrations of phosphorus in the lake. So I want to put that number nine to 10 parts per billion in perspective a little bit. So on the left, I have um, clean lakes and on the right, I have polluted lakes. And this is like super generalized, but it's going to give you an idea of, um, of uh, lakes being on a spectrum from um, low phosphorus to high phosphorus, basically. Um, we also see differences in, in uh, clear lakes have low productivity, um, typically um, support cold water fisheries. And on the other end, you have high productivity, lots of plant growth, lots of nutrients to feed those plants um, and supporting more of a warm water fishery. So um, evidence, um, not only in Maine, but New England and nationwide sh um, has shown that at uh, concentrations of nine to 10 parts per billion, you're gonna you may start seeing um, an increased probability of some type of algal bloom. And it may be a localized bloom, like we were seeing in North Pond back in 2016 when we did the watershed survey there. So Gray Pond right now is at this nine parts per billion. So my message here is that it's really important to hold the line here. We do not want to go any higher than this um, so that we, we're not gonna um, put the water quality more at risk than it is now. So the next, Charlie, Charlie's going to take over next um, after this slide, but uh, he's going to be talking about some recommendations um, that are going to be coming out of the management plan. 
Uh, but what I wanted to show was this map on the left is showing the results of the 2018 watershed survey. And this was a survey of all the developed land in the watershed, including the roads um, and all the homes that were located on near a stream or on the shoreline. And you can see all these tiny little red dots represent a single site that erosion or some other water quality, um, something that would affect water quality was documented, largely erosion sites, as you can see um, in these pictures on the right. So um, I guess 237 total sites were documented. And of those sites, 84% of those sites are associated with residential development. Okay, so that includes the driveways, trails and paths that go down to the water. It could have been the, um, the house itself, like the drip line coming down, um, causing erosion, um, and then private roads that serve those residential properties. So there's a lot that many of you on this call can do um, to protect and reduce the um, phosphorus getting to the lake. And a simple thing you can do is plant a buffer. Um, and some re more recommendations will be coming up later. So I won't go into solutions, but I will tell you that there are problems and there's plenty of opportunity to address them. I'll turn over to you, Charlie. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm just going to preface uh, what I'm going to say now by uh, just discussing the management plan for one moment. The management plan is a 10-year plan that we're working in partnership with uh, Maine DEP to develop and also US EPA. And as Jen and others have said, what we want to do is reverse the trend. And uh, looking at uh, Jen's uh, recent chart, I'd also like to turn back that dial on that, uh, on that gauge that she had. Um, and the way that we can do that, um, one of the ways, uh, and that was done on East Pond, is uh, an in-lake treatment or an alum treatment, uh, putting aluminum into the lake. And what aluminum does is it binds phosphorus in the sediments and keeps it from being released into the water uh, and therefore feeding algae. Uh, a well done treatment on the right kind of lake will last as long as 15 or 20 years uh, it cost a million dollars on East Pond. Um, Great Pond's a lot bigger, and we would estimate that it would cost at least four million and maybe more on Great Pond uh, to get the same kind of uh, effect. Um, the problem is, is that based on the latest science, uh, it's not an effective strategy at this time. Uh, internal loading is only about 10% of the problem, and you've got external loading or dirt and uh, runoff being close to 70% of the problem. This next picture dramatically shows um, water runoff going into Lake Michigan. Uh, we didn't have quite as dramatic a picture for Great Pond, but it's the same idea. We've got, as Jen said, hundreds of little streams and five major tributaries coming into Great Pond, all of them carrying some dirt hopefully not as much as what you see here, but this kind of underlines what is at risk and how it gets to the lake. One thing I wanna say about roads is that roads, think about all the ditches next to the roads, and many of those ditches end up uh, at stream crossings and dumping uh, dirt into streams and therefore getting carried to the lake. So it's in addition to that shoreline development, uh, the roads also have a very big impact which is why uh, some of the projects we've been doing over the last decade uh, have been rebuilding camp roads uh, as well and working with the towns on making improvements on town roads as well. As you can see here, uh, the watershed load, uh, it, which is the dirt and the runoff, uh, and uh, is equal to about 70% of the problem in the lake. Again, the internal load or what's coming from the sediments is estimated to be about 10% of the problem in Great Pond. Which leads us to the following conclusion, reduce erosion, keep the dirt out of the lake. And the way it gets to the lake is by runoff. So the second corollary is slow the flow, stop the runoff. It's pretty much that simple. Um, in addition, septics matter and working on uh, having working uh, well-functioning septic systems 
matter and pumping them regularly uh, is important. And one of the things Seven Lakes has done, um, and we started as a land trust protecting land, uh, protecting and conserving land uh, also helps protect water quality because that land is not developed. Uh, and if it is developed, it's carefully managed. Um, some of the land that we have are easements uh, in this picture here. Uh, so it's not as though we are against development, uh, but you have to develop carefully. And when you develop, you need to plant those buffers and get the water into the ground or into the woods before it gets to the lake. That's really the message here is we could live in balance with the lakes, but we have to work hard to do it uh, based on uh, the numbers that we're seeing and the external loading that we have. But conserving land is one of the strategies to help protect the lake long term. One of our challenges is uh, what you see here, heavy rain. Uh, with more rain comes more erosion. And this is a chart that was put together by NOAA uh, several years ago, which shows increased rainfall, heavy rainfall around the country uh, over the last 60 years. And the Northeast has some of the highest numbers, as you can see in the, in the country. And this is an increase in the size of the storms and an increase in the frequency of big storms. What this says to me is that we need to double down on our erosion work to handle these bigger storms. Maine DOT, for, for example, is putting in bigger and bigger culverts into their roads because uh, of this increased precipitation. And, um, and they're wanting to make sure that the, uh, the culverts uh, don't get uh, overrun with water and that um, roads are maintained. Uh, it's a public safety issue as well as a water quality issue. Again, uh, to conclude, recommendations include doubling down on erosion control and watershed efforts um, and uh, doubling down on making sure that we keep runoff out of the lake, whether that be roads or development. We also want to double down on science. It's very important that we monitor the lake, monitor the internal loading, monitor the external loading, one of the areas that we um, have not done as much as we want to in the future is looking at streams. Streams are the conveyor belt, so to speak, for getting that dirty water into the lake. And so we want to do a better job of, of monitoring streams and possibly managing uh, development along streams to keep, it out, to keep dirty water out of the lake. Another recommendation is no alum treatment is called for at this time doesn't mean that it might not be an option uh, in the future, um, but we want to keep that arrow, uh, so to speak, in the quiver so that we uh, have it ready for the future. But the, uh, the message now is focus on the external loading, the dirt and runoff, and, um, and monitor the internal loading to make sure that it doesn't get worse over time. We also want to establish criteria for all of the above. We want to track erosion, um, coming into the lake, we want to track the effectiveness of our um, erosion control measures, our BNPs, and we also want to uh, look at um, and, and increase the science that we do so that we have an early warning system to make sure that internal loading uh, does not uh, present us uh, with problems like North Pond or East Pond. Uh, one last question. Where would you like us to focus our efforts? And the options are preventing algal blooms, monitoring and testing water quality science, educating lakefront residents, ensuring enforcement of regulations having to do with shoreland zoning, et cetera. And finally, reducing the amount of pollution entering the lake. And the question here rephrased is, what do you think local conservation groups should be focusing our efforts on?
Well, I'll start at the bottom because that's got the uh, the biggest uh, percentage of votes. And that says reducing the amount of pollution entering the lake, 49%. Uh, the second uh, strongest uh, category is educating lakefront residents with 18%. The next is uh, with 13%, ensuring enforcement of regulations having to do with shoreland zoning. The next category, 10% monitoring and testing water quality. And finally, at 9%, preventing algal blooms. Thank you again for your participation and providing us feedback. And as Jen said, we're, we're wrapping up the management planning over the next month or so. We'll have a uh, final report out in the next two months. And we would like your feedback and uh, ongoing uh, participation in this work. Thank you. I believe I'm going to be turning it over to Laura Rose Day, the uh, CEO uh, of Seven Lakes Alliance. Laura. I'm going to just pick up the uh, baton here. Um, Laura may be having trouble um, getting no, on the I'm, call. I'm here actually, I, I'm on, but uh, someone needs to start the video. Um, the host needs to start the video. But in the meantime, uh, yeah, I'm Laura Rose Day, the CEO at Seven Lakes. And um, my, um, my, my role in this meeting is um, uh, to emphasize the actions that have uh, come out of the work that uh, this whole group has been doing um, over the, you know, over the last several months. So the public outreach um, that we're doing in this meeting um, needs to continue. We know that um, when people are aware of the issues, when they know what the problems are and what they can do about them, uh, people will step up to protect the lake. So uh, the public outreach will continue through all of our organizations, but it also includes neighbor to neighbor uh, communication about these issues and um, really the use of all of the tools that we have at our disposal to just make people understand what the problems are so that we can work on them together. The good news is, as you're going to hear, there are a lot of ways that we can actually do that, which is really, really great news uh, from, from this report. Uh, erosion control. Uh, we need to address all of the erosion sites that are identified. There are numerous ways to do that. Uh, they range from major road projects to work on specific pieces of land. But again, we can't say it enough, keeping dirt out of the waters uh, in this watershed and out of the lakes is the key to keeping the lakes from developing water quality problems in the future and the key to reversing the trend. Septic systems, uh, can be a significant problem in localized areas. What the work here has shown is that they are not um, a significant issue lakewide in terms of the need for immediate action. But as uh, Jen uh, discussed in detail, they can be significant issues um, in, in uh, localized areas. So uh, we need to pay attention to them. Buffers, um, increasing and improving shoreline buffers, not just on lake shores, but also on tributaries that lead into the lake so that we can keep um, uh, sediment from building up in those areas. I'm sure that, that many of you can think of a place where you know that a stream comes in um, into to a lake and um, has, uh, is bringing with it um, uh, sedimentation. Um, conserving land uh, here at Seven Lakes, uh, our land trust work uh, weighs heavily uh, a piece of land's ability to protect water quality. So uh, we're already doing that in that way. And there are many ways that um, people throughout the um, Great Pond uh, area and the entire region, uh, either through agreeing to certain protections on their property, um, uh, through easements or um, other, other tools. Ordinances, uh, lakes, uh, our waters are a shared resource. And when you have a shared resource, you also need to have some rules to protect uh, the, the, common, um, the common resource that everyone uses. So strengthening town ordinances, um, always thinking about whether there's a, uh, there are appropriate tools uh, to put in place or to strengthen uh, is really key. And for instance, there are moorings ordinances uh, aimed at protecting the lakes that um, one will be on the ballot in 
um, in Belgrade um, this, coming, this coming year. Uh, monitoring, we don't know how to prioritize um, our work and how to make it most effective if we don't have good information. And we're really fortunate throughout the region and including on Gray Pond to have a great system uh, that has both um, uh, trained scientists and also fantastic citizen scientists also um, who uh, get training, who help make sure that we know what we're talking about. Um, a lot of the information that go is going into this report is uh, the latest information, it's updated, uh, it's well beyond what we've had in hand uh, for, for many years. So that will make our, our, um, our efforts much better. And finally, um, fundraising, I would say resource raising, uh, this can be funding to do the work that needs to be done, but it can also be uh, volunteer time, which is incredibly valuable. And again, we're fortunate um, to have in, um, in the Great Pond area, but um, we, we, we could definitely use more volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, um, in numerous, there are numerous ways to do that. Um, and you can get in touch with um, Belgrade Lakes Association or Seven Lakes to find out the best ways to connect. Next slide. And finally, um, along with the good news that uh, the external load is really where our major threat continues to come from, um, there's a lot that you can do now. And a lot of these things are relatively simple, you know, more good news, uh, shorefront development. Um, I'm not gonna read this slide, but there are a lot of very basic things you can do having to do with uh, buffers, um, with covering dirt so that it simply doesn't run off in major rain events like the one that we just had recently, uh, not using fertilizer, which um, uh, can uh, put phosphorus um, and other uh, harmful substances in the lake. Uh, pet waste um, sounds like a, a minor, minor issue, but uh, cleaning up your pet waste is an essential thing to do. Um, uh, don't rake up the, the organic material on, on the shorefront that can help buffer water from getting into the lakes. Uh, septic systems again here, um, even though we're talking about 2% in the scheme of the entire lake, uh, again, they can locally be um, a significant problem. So replace the pre-1974 systems and, uh, and cesspools um, and pump them out. Maintain uh, your septic systems, even if they're newer, they still need maintenance. Uh, roads, uh, there, there are uh, lots of opportunities um, to fix runoff from roads. Uh, I, I am again sure that many of you uh, can think of areas where whenever there's a major rain, you can see runoff from a road. We want to fix those places. These are things that are within our control and will buy us uh, a lot of time and water quality um, into the future. And the more we um, local investment we can make in these projects, the more investment that we can attract from outside sources, uh, such as um, uh, Clean Water Act funds that the state DEP administers here and have, have really done uh, great projects to help the lakes. So um, I think that um, the, the last thing is, um, Support your lake associations. Uh, that's true throughout on every lake in, in, the, in the region. Um, the lakes are connected in, in many ways. Um, you know, there's seven lakes in BLA, um, uh, BLA for Great Pond and Long Pond. Um, we all have committees uh, that you can participate in and many projects and as I said before, volunteer efforts. So uh, either BLA uh, for back to Great Pond um, either BLA or Seven Lakes Alliance, um, we would be willing to help connect you with ways to help the lake at any time. That's what we're here for. So um, thank you all so much for participating. And I'm going to turn it over to Carol to wrap up. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Laura, as well as our other presenters, Anthony, Charlie, Danielle, and Jen. Uh, we appreciate the concise manner in which we have laid this out for you and uh, the hard work that they did in, in getting that ready. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of work left to do. Uh, the BLA and the 7LA have worked very closely together on uh, 
projects to this point and will continue to be cooperative. You will see that there's this is a cooperative and collaborative uh, process of what we're doing along with our other partners. The contact information for both uh, organizations is listed on the screen. Feel free to contact either one of us with your thoughts or your comments or any questions that you may think of after the presentation. And if you are not a member of the organizations, we encourage you to belong. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn the question and answer session over to another one of our partners, Amanda Pratt from Maine DEP, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. We work very closely with DEP, are very grateful for their support and uh, the work that they do as, in helping us work here on the lake. So Amanda? Thank you, Carol. Um, yep, I'm going to be moderating the question and answer session. So we have quite a few questions that have come in, but if you have uh, more questions, please type them into the Q&A box and uh, we'll get to them. So the first question for our panelists, uh, I think this one I'm going to give to Charlie or maybe Carol can answer it. Um, has there been a significant increase in Lake Smart certified properties? And if so, has that had an impact? I'll try to answer it. Um, I don't know the exact number of uh, Lake Smart properties, but there definitely have, have been strong efforts in Lake Smart properties, uh, not only on Great Pond, but on North Pond, McGraw Pond, Salmon Lake, and East Pond uh, in particular over the last several years, along with obviously Long Pond as well. Um, so again, I don't have the precise numbers. We've recently, um, towards the uh, this summer, uh, become much more involved in uh, helping um, run and administer the Lake Smart program. Uh, so going forward, that's something that we are tracking. Uh, and yes, all of this is part of the solution. Um, somebody mentioned earlier the whole um, social marketing component, people talking to their neighbors. Uh, Lake Smart is big on that um, and spreading the word uh, in the community. Um, Programs like YCC and some of the road um, re restoration programs that we do um, have a lot of you know, construction uh, as part of what they're doing. Um, the Lake Smart social marketing, uh, people reaching out to each other is really critical. Um, and uh, Carol, uh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I don't have the exact number, so um, we just need more and we need to continue to work on getting those buffers on those properties that are not currently Lake Smart certifiable. Okay, and then um, someone asked if the presentation was being recorded and shared and the answer is yes. So Seven Lakes and BLA, I assume, are going to be disseminating that link uh, after the presentation or in the next couple of days. So look out for that um, for anyone that wasn't able to come. Um, question for, I'll give this one to Jen. What are the main sources of erosion? The main sources of erosion, um, there's a lot of erosion related to the roads. Uh, so th if you're asking specifically about erosion in the watershed, I'd say roads have a pretty big impact because there are large erosion problems. Um, but there are a lot of little examples of erosion on many, many, many developed shoreline properties, as you saw on the map that I showed. So some examples of shoreline erosion would be um, uh, that are associated with uh, residential property, particularly could be where the water comes off of your roof line and creates the divots under where the, um, the rain hits and then creates channels that sometimes are directed directly in, towards the lake. Um, driveway runoff is another one. So. Um, when we say slow the flow, that's um, getting the water to slow down because once the water starts going fast, it picks up velocity and it picks up the sediment with it and that's how it's getting to the lake. So slow the flow means get the water into the ground at the source. So if you can get it into the ground through a drip line trench at your drip line so that it's not then adding to driveway or trail, you know, and making its way down to the water. Um, Shoreline erosion is another big one um, where people, you know, people cut down their buffers um, and then the shoreline um, when you have ice coming in in the winter can really do some significant damage if you don't have ve good vegetation or vegetative cover on the shorelines. So those are some examples that I can think of right, right off the top of my head. 
Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, I'm gonna give this one to Danielle. Uh, and I think Linda Bacon kind of answered this in the chat box, but someone was wondering what the parts per billion reading uh, for phosphorus was in North Pond before the algae bloom this past summer. So it got up to 30 parts per billion um, this summer. And so compared to, you know, we were talking about 10 parts per billion in Great Pond. So, um, you know, there's, it, it does take a bit of, every lake's different. So we can't predict exactly at what point uh, Great Pond would start turning that color. So we need to be proactive about getting on top of this. And for people that want to learn more about the science behind the lakes and a deep dive into the water quality, you're hosting another webinar about that soon? Yes. Yeah, so in January, uh, myself and Whitney King from Colby will host a Great Pond Q&A science session. So just where people have science questions or we can get to some of the nitty gritty and details that we didn't have time for tonight. That'll be in January. So keep an eye on the BLA and the Seven Lakes Alliance Facebook pages or our email list. Um, so we'll let you know a date after the holidays so we can answer all your pressing science questions that you have. Great, thanks Danielle. Uh, I'm gonna ask Charlie the next one. There, there are a few questions about specific issues on the lake, um, but just in general, if someone has a concern about erosion on their property or um, excess water draining onto their property or uh, wants technical assistance, um, who should they contact? Uh, they should contact Seven Lakes Alliance. Um, we have uh, a number of programs. We are um, working to run the Lake Smart program in partnership with lots of volunteers throughout the watershed. Uh, so that's that's an important first step. Um, if you have an active erosion problem uh, that you know about or that you think you might have, um, our Youth Conservation Corps or myself, uh, I, I run some of the road reconstruction programs that we do. We shorthand call it the 319 program because that's the grant money that we use to, uh, to help fix those roads. But uh, so if, if you know it's a driveway problem or a major erosion problem, please call me. We have Art Grindle with Seven Lakes Alliance who is running our uh, Youth Conservation Corps program now. Um, but also just send a note to our info at uh, Seven Lakes Alliance if, uh, if you don't have one of our personal emails. Uh, to get it started, we'll, uh, we'll follow up. Uh, one quick thing I wanted to note, uh, having been involved in the East Pond project, we were talking parts per billion and algal blooms. East Pond, uh, when uh, the, uh, was getting algal blooms every year uh, for 20 years, had an uh, average uh, phosphorus load of about 18 parts per billion. So a, a little phosphorus goes a long way, and, uh, which is why we are emphasizing this external loading uh, so strongly. Thank you. Um, this one, maybe I'll send to Laura um, or maybe Carol. Can you explain the difference in mission for Seven Lakes versus Belgrade Lakes Association? Sure. Um, so Seven Lakes Alliance's mission is to conserve the uh, waters and lands of the Belgrade Lakes region for all. So we have a uh, region-wide focus as opposed to a focus only on um, Great and Long Pond only. That's a big job, but that's the Belgrade Lakes Association. That I think is the, um, the simplest distinction. Uh, we work together um, on a number of projects, and I think that the, the key to all of this is integrating land and water and not no longer thinking of them as separate uh, things because they relate very much to each other. And also um, all of the lakes, um, not only uh, physically in, in many cases impact each other directly, but also what we learn on one lake, uh, we can apply on others. That's happened from East Pond to Great Pond. Uh, what we're learning on Great Pond and East Pond, uh, we will be working with North Pond Association so another um, you know, group focused at the, at the local level um, to address issues there. So uh, we, we're really complimentary. Thank you. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give the next question to Jen. Uh, this is a question about the land cover map that you shared and someone wanted to know how often that data is updated, the land and, and watershed information. 
Uh, not very often. Um, this was a special project that was completed uh, because the land cover data was so outdated. I think the last one was a statewide land cover layer that was completed in 1998. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, but you, so you updated um, the specific map for the, the watershed-based plan, so that's all new. So that's great. Um, this question I'm going to give to Danielle. Uh, someone was wondering what data we have on changes in water temperature in the last 50 years. And this might be one you wanna to punt to your water quality discussion, but. Well, we can answer this. I mean, throughout the, throughout the Belgrades and throughout Maine, I think we've seen an increase in surface water temperatures over the last 50 years. I mean, that's again, one of the benefit of having these really long data sets that are curated by the DEP and Lake Stewards of Maine. Um, but yeah, certainly throughout this region, there's been a warming of the surface waters of our lakes. Um, this summer, some of the warmest temperatures we've seen for our lake water in the record. So uh, maybe not Great Pond, but definitely, well, yeah, for a lot of the lakes, like East Pond and North Pond, the shallower ones in particular, it was quite, water water is quite warm. And I'm, I'm guessing Great Pond have warmer surface waters as well. Okay, I'm gonna um, give the next question to Charlie. How does one know if their property was one of the 237 NPS areas identified? Uh, letters have gone out to all of those um, persons that uh, had properties that were identified, um, indicating that uh, we are following up on that. Um, Art Grindle, who I referred to earlier, um, was hired um, both uh, through um, Seven Lakes and BLA uh, this summer to follow up on the, those uh, letters. And uh, the same is gonna happen on Long Pond. We're gonna be sending out letters to the residents of Long Pond um, over the next several months uh, to let them know that their properties were identified. Uh, and uh, we are looking to work with homeowners and landowners to um, fix those problems. Great, thank you. And I just saw Linda Bacon commented uh, in the chat that DEP is conducting temperature trend analyses on the 50 year data set right now and expects to have a report ready by June of 2021. So for those of you interested in that data. Um, all right, I'm gonna I ask- I wanna point out, Amanda, just oh. I, I meant to say this. I mean, you may just think it's the water getting warmer, but I think it's important for people to know as part of the climate change issue is that the type of algae that we don't want, you know, we need algae in the lake for the fish. You know, that's, it's a part of the food chain, but the type of algae we don't want does really well in warm water. And so the warmer our lakes get, the more competitive they get with, against other algae. So I think it's not just about how warm the water is, it's creating conditions for more blooms. That's a great point. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. Um, I'm gonna ask Jen the next question. Why is forest land such a large source of phosphorus? The reason that forest land is such a large percentage of the phosphorus load for Great Pond is because it, it covers such a large land area. So if you had a, um, a watershed with a smaller uh, percentage of forest land, the load would be smaller. But because it's you know 70 um, plus percent, um, load is pretty high. Okay. In terms of phosphorus coefficients, it has a very low coefficient compared to developed land areas. Right, right. Okay, so we had a couple questions about the number of camps on the shoreline. So Matt Scott uh, had a question. Um, he did a count in 1970 and there were 729. Uh, we had another question about how many properties were on the shoreline, and I did look up, there are 847 lots, um, but I don't know about the number of camps. I don't know if, Charlie, you have a number. I do not. I had always heard that we had, you know, somewhere between six and 700. So um, how many of those 847 lots have actually been developed? We don't have a current count, um, but... Uh, it's something that ultimately we want to be doing going forward is to have really a database of all the properties and to understand what's been done on the ground and what we uh, are recommending on, on each lot going forward. Great. But um, that number should be about right, um, you know, 700 plus or minus. Yep. So this one I'll ask Jen. 
if an alum treatment would nullify the negative effects of internal loading, why wouldn't we do this as we continue to work runoff issues, work on runoff issues as this feeds the internal loading over time? I like that you gave me this question, Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be the best to answer it. I don't know about that. Um, why would we? Because the the percentage of phosphorus coming from the internal load is right now it's relatively small compared to the total load that's coming into the lake. So by putting alum in the lake, you're putting a lot of money and effort into something that isn't really causing the problem. Right now, we know that the problem is being caused by all the phosphorus coming in from the watershed. Yeah, and the alum treatment's very expensive. So it's, it's kind of like th throwing this very expensive tool that you don't really need that's not really gonna help very much um, in the short term anyway. Um, someone asked- One of the, let me- Oh, go ahead, Charlie. I was just gonna, I was only gonna add that one of the uh, big concerns that we've heard about from folks on Great Pond in the last you know, five years uh, is the gliotrichia and the uh, metaphyton. And we don't believe that the um, alum treatment would take care of those problems. Those problems we believe have more to do with what's going on in the shallower areas of the lake. Um, it, so that's one of the um, concerns we have is to um, recommend spending that kind of money on something that might not fix the problem that people care about. Yeah, that's, that's also a really good point. Um, there was a follow-up question. If someone did not receive a letter after the watershed survey, should they assume their property is okay? Um, and can they look at the results of the survey? So where could people find more information about the watershed survey results? Uh, Amanda, I believe we have published on the BLA website the watershed survey results. Okay. So if you go to bla.org, you should find Great. it. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a few questions about and concerns about lawn clippings, um, either people, people seeing lawn clippings in the water or asking what they should do with their lawn clippings. Um, if anyone wants to, I don't know, Charlie? Sure, um, don't throw them in the lake. Um, and the same goes with your leaves that you might uh, rake up, uh, put them in the woods um, and put them, you know, 50 feet back, 100 feet back into the woods, and they'll slowly break down. And um, the woods are the best place to put water and any kind of uh, plant material that you have. Okay, uh, we're running out of time here a little bit. So I'll ask maybe a couple more questions and then some of the other questions we might send a follow-up email. Um, there's a few really good ideas from people about, about ways that we can, we can tackle buffers. So considering tax abatements, um, some specific questions about um, what's allowed in the shoreline, shoreline area or you know, paved versus bluestone gravel. And those sort of questions would be great to send to Art um, and Seven Lakes Alliance and get technical assistance. So I would encourage you um, to follow up with Seven Lakes if those were your questions. Um, I'll ask this question uh, for, I guess, for Charlie. Um, in Fairfield, there's a huge problem with forever chemicals from farm sludge polluting drinking water wells. Is there any use of that same polluting sludge in the Belgrade area that we know of, I guess? I'm not aware of any sludge being put in Belgrade. Um, back 20 years ago in Mount Vernon, we created an ordinance that required annual testing and, and uh, putting in the ground uh, water testing. Uh, to, if somebody wanted to um, use sludge, you can't ban sludge through an ordinance, but you can make regulation of it very strict. Uh, and that is a disincentive. Uh, and the sludge producers typically will then uh, bring their sludge to towns that don't have uh, that kind of oversight. So. I'm not aware of there being sludge being used. I have heard of um, uh, some of the, um, potentially some of the septic material being used on farms, but not sludge from a water treatment plant. Uh, part of the problem with the water treatment plant, as was pointed out by the question, are those uh, chemicals that uh, are not separated in the water treatment. Okay. 
um, PCBs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're at 7.45. I don't know if we wanna call it there or answer a couple more questions. I think, I think uh, being respectful of people's time, uh, we should uh, get those questions out and get them posted um, on our website so that we, um, next time we have one of these meetings, we'll have folks that wanna come and, and stay through the meeting as well. Um, so I'll go ahead. This will conclude our presentation tonight. Uh, as we said, we will consolidate questions and get them out to you. We uh, really appreciate your uh, tuning in and staying with us. And I, I'll end the meeting the way I started the meeting is we need to keep the dirt out of the lakes. We may have to make a motto or get a tattoo or do something, but that's the, the bottom line to all of this. So everyone have a wonderful holiday season and we hope that we'll see you all back here at the lake. Uh, for those of you who aren't fortunate enough to live here year round. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>